Okay, so I want to welcome everybody for our second Garner Smarter. We're going to be discussing Three Seasons Planting. I want to thank Jim for um, being our presenter this um, afternoon. Um, so um, let me tell you a little bit about the Garner Smarter program. So it's a series of um, public educated lectures in partnership with the Master of Garners as well as the Calvert Library. It helps support the library's uh, mission of serving as a great way to information, imagination, and inspiration. Next slide, Jim. A little bit about the Master Garner program. Um, it is um, a University of Maryland um, service. Um, they get connected to the university extension and their mission is to educate um, our community about safe and effective and sustainable horticultural practices that build healthy gardens, landscapes, and communities. Jim will also be discussing his, um, his project in managing the children um, gardens that are located on the Anne Marie Sculpture and Garden and Art Center. And just a reminder, our next Garden Smarter program will be um, next Saturday, February 20th at 10 a.m. And we will be um, discussing container garnings, bags, bears, and old boots. And you can start registering through the Calvert um, Library website. Okay, go um, and speak in, Jim. Okay, uh, it's good to be here today on this cold day, looking out on the snow. It's hard to believe we're gonna be talking about planting for the spring but this is when we have to start making our plans. Uh, we, this particular uh, list of activities for uh, master gardeners, baywise and composting and native plants, and we are on falling under the grow it and eat it in our project. And I'm going to talk to you today, I'm gonna to start with a little introduction of Anne Marie Children's Garden on Solomon's Island. And uh, this has been in operation for about uh, 10 years. Uh, and at this point, we have been uh, grow growing uh, the various crops. Uh, we didn't have a plan to do this in terms of uh, three crop planting. What happened is a steady evolution. One of the things we do with our garden is to take the produce to the food pantries around this uh, here in Southern Maryland and every year we were trying to get more production from the limited space we have. Our gardens are consisted of raised beds and they're 10 feet long and four foot uh, in diameter. And we have eight of those so that we can rotate uh, the various crops. And I'm gonna be talking to you about that. Uh, every year uh, we have about 250 uh, children as you see here, uh, an example of uh, one of the classes. I, I, if you look uh, in the right hand side and down below, you'll see a purple bag. Uh, that's a bag full of uh, potatoes and uh, with the soil in it, we're gonna dump that into this black uh, container in the front and the kids get to go through it and um, perhaps see their first uh, uh, potato that ever comes from a, a crop in a garden. Uh, so we do this every day and uh, over the uh, last uh, 10 years, we've uh, had an interaction with about 2,500 children. Uh, we did not, I, I, I said, we did not start out trying to do succession gardening, but as we tried to give more uh, food to the food pantries, uh, we kept trying to refine our, act, uh, our activities uh, so that we would get more production. So what I've uh, done I, here at the beginning, I have several things that I think are key elements of succession gardening. Uh, I'm gonna go through those with you uh, but we can ask questions uh, at the end. You might want to take a little bit of note if you have a question on this. Uh, one of the most th important things that I found as we went along is to have a, a schedule or a plan to keep track of the crops and the planting and the harvest dates. Uh, I have an example of that in one of the later slides. Uh, it's also important to know uh, what varieties are best for your area and the purpose of your garden for your family. If you are a, a somebody that likes fresh corn, uh, then you can certainly grow that. Uh, generally in raised beds, corn take up uh, too much space and I don't tend to use those. 
but so but if you like uh, uh, tomatoes of all different types, you can have a whole tomato garden. It, that's up to you. So another set of things to know, it's important for, especially with this uh, philosophy and this approach to gardening, is to know the dates for the first frost and the last frost in your zone. I have a slide here with a little bit more information on that. Uh, you wanna know the amount of space all of your plant varieties require at maturity. Uh, if you have uh, tomato plants that uh, are indeterminate, they're gonna get really big and really tall and they'll be uh, shading some of your other uh, plants in there. Uh, what I tend to do when I'm looking at planting is try to visualize the size of the plant that's going to go into that space. I do not plant in rows. I plant in the availability of the sunshine and, and the exposures and what's going to be next to them. So I sort of get that in my mind. For instance, with beans, I'll go and uh, I'll look at it and say a bean plant's this big and I'll put my uh, seeds about that far equally throughout the whole uh, planting area that I'm working on. Uh, you want to know the, uh, the one of the most important thing or the germination time particularly is uh, important because we're going to try to be working around that germination time to get the maximum amount of production. Uh, I, uh, in the early springs we're going to be looking for things with a very uh, fast germination time and also a time to uh, market. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, know the uh, amount of sunshine in there in the, your garden, that's a, that's a very important thing because everything is driven by the sunshine and the energy. Uh, I have a picture here of uh, my garden, well, actually my yard, and you can see with all the patches of sun. Uh, there's places that, uh, well, none of this area would I put a garden uh, for vegetables. It's just too shaded and too uncertain. But you do notice as you look at these types of things that those uh, areas of light move back and forth depending upon the angle of the sun. If you look in the distance, uh, my, the house is in the distance, that area there was cleared more and I have enough sunshine there for a garden, but I only get even there only about five hours a day, six hours a day of sun. So I, uh, and compared to what we're getting with the Anne Marie garden, my production is considerably less. Did I, I, did I skip a slide? No, no, I'm okay. Okay, going on. All right. Uh, other things to think about. So you wanna know uh, what plants grow together. Uh, I have here the example of what the Native American Indians did. They had the, uh, they call it the three sisters, but there were really four plants types that were in that, uh, corn, uh, beans, squash, and sunflower. The corn uh, was quite good in terms of uh, providing a place for the pole beans to go up. And so the corn was planted and then the bean, the pole beans would start to go up. The uh, squash, uh, lay down underneath, it had it tended to have a lot of uh, spikes and other things on it, so that kept some of the, uh, uh, the pests away. And then the sunflower was used as a windbreak, and when you put all those things together around the outside, when you put all of those things together, uh, it came out with more production and they developed that over centuries. Uh, one of the things that you wanna know is how to prune properly, just recently, uh, I have noticed uh, in our garden that by uh, paying attention to uh, uh, particularly the tomatoes, uh, getting the old uh, dying leaves uh, out of there and opening it up and uh, channeling the uh, energy of the plant uh, to the new suckers that have flowers, uh, I, we can extend the growing production period of the tomatoes and also avoid disease. So that's something that uh, I, I pay attention to now. Uh, under, and it's important to understand the use of staggered planting to increase uh, your favorite crops. For instance, uh, with lettuces, uh, you can, uh, in one of the beds, and I, you'll see the pictures of the beds coming up, uh, we usually plant uh, one section of it, and then we'll wait a couple of weeks and plant the second section. But in the meantime, but that's with when we're planting the bean seeds. Generally, I'll even head start uh, bean plants indoors to give myself a jump uh, on the season and uh, reduce my time of production uh, in the garden. 
you want to, so the staggered planting is a very important part uh, for uh, having more of your favorite crops so that you can get them uh, in days apart uh, throughout the first part of the summer. Uh, I, it's very important to, I think, and helpful to make a sketch for your uh, garden layout uh, for all the beds and the box sections and enter the crop names and the dates planted. Here's an example uh, for what uh, we look at. Uh, the, at the top in the uh, dark blue is the spring season. In the middle is the summer uh, plants that we consider. Uh, and at the bottom is uh, what we look at in terms of the fall. Uh, I put the uh, planting date in there. Uh, so that I've got that. I know what I had in there last year uh, when I'm looking later on in the year. Uh, I did, I, I put on the bottom there that uh, with the big boy tomatoes, uh, pruning made a difference and uh, I was able to carry that particular part of the box uh, through to the end with the uh, uh, tomatoes all the way until October. Uh, carrots uh, in the fall, this is a, uh, in the fall is a good time for your root crops. Uh, and uh, so I started out then, starting from the top in the middle, I had top choy, which is a 40 day uh, pr uh, production. I had, then I came down and had a sweet tangerine tomato and they are an earlier tomato. I usually get a, uh, a crop by, by uh, 4th of July and it's a particularly good tasting uh, tomato. And then as we got to September down below, uh, nine and five there, these are the dates that I was working with them on. Uh, then I put in the root crops like carrots or beets. And I will frequently use, I find that the uh, Chinese uh, mustards and uh, lettuces uh, are particularly good. You know, the Chinese have to feed a lot of people. They have a lot of varieties that can be ready in 40 or 45 days. So your pak choys and your tot choys are really important both in the spring and in the fall. Uh, here's some of the, uh, I, did, I, put, I found this information, I thought you might uh, find it useful. Uh, the free, this is your uh, different uh, ways to understand the uh, frost and the, uh, and the temperatures. Uh, a frost advisory is what occurs when the temperature is expected to fall in the range of 36 degrees down to about 32 degrees. Your freeze warning is usually issued when there is an 80% chance that the temperature is going to hit 32. And the hard freeze is, will occur when the, uh, uh, the, the temperature that you are expecting is somewhere uh, below 28 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this is, in, it's getting more difficult with the changing, uh, changing weather to really uh, determine when you're gonna see that last freeze. Uh, what we've been doing is this, uh, thank goodness we have long range forecasts now and before I put these things in in that spring time period, uh, I really take a good hard look at the weather. So you got to pay attention to that. Uh, okay, uh, the, the those distinct sections of raised beds that you label in is particularly uh, important uh, because of the need for crop rotation. Uh, you want to know what uh, and, and a written format. Thing, I've already shown uh, my little sketch of the boxes that I use for planning. Uh, you want to be sure that you rotate your crops uh, as often as possible, depending upon the type. For instance, your tomatoes and your eggplants and your peppers are all in the same family and they have the same diseases. So you want to rotate that one every year if you can. And it helps if you have the number of boxes or beds that I have with eight uh, in, the, in the garden, uh, that helps me rotate a little easier. If you only have two uh, planting areas, uh, you don't have much option on that rotation. So it's, it's good to have more sections that you control and keep a record on uh, to avoid some of the problems uh, with uh, diseases and that come along with planting in the same place. So one of the important things I uh, wanted to stress a little bit, uh, you can do these gardens uh, and this uh, philosophy uh, in raised beds, you can do it in natural uh, soils, uh, but you want, probably want to uh, raise, uh, have mounds uh, so that you have some control. Because if you look down, I've, this is a, a picture of my yard. And I always like when I'm starting any new garden anywhere to go out with a shovel and I dig down like you see here, 
and I take a look at uh, the different uh, soil uh, horizons. You can look here, this is Calvert County, it's typical uh, here for, we either have sand here or we have uh, clay. Uh, but in my particular uh, situation, I've got, got about two inches of good, fairly good topsoil over most of the garden. And then I have an area of gray clay that's about eight to 10 inches uh, deep. Uh, and is impermeable to water. And then if I go a, another, uh, down to about 12, 14 inches, I start to get uh, to a, loo a, a looser, sandy, clay, uh, pebble type of soil. So if, for instance, if you're planting a tree and you just dig a little bit of a hole and you still are in the clay area, you're, it's gonna end up being like a, a pot without a drain and you won't have any success with the plant, uh, tree. So I always make sure that I'm gonna go down below uh, into that third layer and that third horizon. So, and that brings us to generally the uh, soil requirements. I have a picture here of, uh, from one of the garden beds and that is really good soil. Uh, it's loose, it's friable, it's, uh, it's a result of uh, constant compost additions over a 10 year period. And what you'll find is uh, we aren't going to find any clay. You'll find that the, uh, the water is very permeable. It goes in there. There's oxygen in that soil. Uh, and if you are following global warming uh, uh, information, these types of soils are a very good carbon sink. Uh, and that's what we've lost in so much of our agricultural areas. And that's one a part of the reason we're having the global warming situation. So when you can get to soil like this, it's a living thing. There are fungi in there, there's insects in there, there's worms in there, all of this part of the natural uh, uh, production of soils. Uh, I find the most important thing too is to, I save every leaf uh, and I make sure I get it composted. Uh, leaf grow is available, which is coming uh, primarily from leaves, uh, from some of the suppliers in the county. Uh, I bring in a, a, a truckload of uh, the compost, the uh, leaf grow uh, every year. I sometimes, if I'm setting up a new bed, I'll have them mix the leaf grow in with uh, topsoil because there's some more different minerals in the topsoil uh, for plant setting up a new bed or uh, for raised beds. Uh, so how does this all then really work? These, the, I, what I tried to do was give all the different uh, things that you wanna consider in these uh, first slides. Uh, so let's see, here it is springtime. What are we going to be doing? So starting head, uh, head starting plants indoors uh, is a very important tool and a part of the philosophy of how we get more out of the garden. Uh, indoor culture systems and outdoor, uh, with outdoor covering systems are helpful. Uh, the first crop of cold tolerant plant, plants uh, can be started indoors. And some of your larger plants, the tomatoes and the peppers, uh, you can plant in uh, late February or March and you have to sort of look at the weather. Uh, but I, I do that on the indoors. Uh, you can do a little bit of that with just plain uh, flats and taking it out to outside greenhouses or remay uh, structures. And you'll see a picture of that coming up. Uh, and that can, but those you don't put in uh, the, the warm, larger plants, the tomatoes and everything, you don't put those until in sometime in May when uh, you are, I can look ahead at the weather and decide if it's a good time to put them in. Uh, one of the things that we do, it's sort of fun if you're uh, working uh, with other people and have other uh, neighbors and everything is to have a planting party. Uh, here's some of the flats that we are planting with lettuces and, uh, and tomatoes and peppers and uh, all the different ones. And uh, then from these flats, we'll go is particularly with the larger plants that, that will be planted uh, in the uh, summer season. Uh, we go into uh, up to four inch uh, pots so that we get a fairly large uh, transplant. Uh, we also, with the greens, uh, we try to get to at least four to uh, four leaf or so uh, plants that we can then put directly into the uh, waiting garden. Uh, here's an example of uh, fluorescent lighting. The, so if you're gonna do the head starting, uh, it's important to have some fluorescent lighting like this or uh, LED lighting. I have another picture of that. 
And these the lights are changing constantly. The new technologies for lights uh, are, uh, in, in terms of light efficiency, are really becoming uh, really good and are getting a little cheaper. Uh, fluorescent lighting like this, uh, in a with a uh, where you can put your flats in, uh, is the sort of the old style, which is what I have. I have three stacks of. Uh, uh, lights uh, in the basement. Uh, this is just one uh, tray or one layer. And then uh, I also will use uh, an LED uh, uh, light with a uh, reflector on it uh, to put over uh, large trays. Uh, for instance, uh, like uh, if I have uh, decided to use a, uh, a peat pot for certain plants, uh, I, I can put that the peat, the peat pots in a tray. I can put an LED light up above, uh, and uh, it helps you, you to well. It's an alternative to the uh, this other type of lighting. So here we are. Uh, it's in my light uh, table, which has a heat pad underneath because for those warm weather crops, it really makes a difference for a few days uh, for germination to have uh, a heat uh, mat underneath. And we're look, this is looking uh, at about uh, coming into late May uh, in terms of having planted in the uh, Febu late February and March. So I'm getting a fairly large tomato plant. When I uh, coming out of the house, uh, I like to have a little uh, garden uh, greenhouse. And I, I find it quite useful to go over the top of the stone patio I have because the stones hold the heat through the night. So I will move from those light tables out to uh, this little greenhouse and then uh, in the early spring. And then I'd, if it gets really cold, I'll come back in and I'll pick up the trays and I'll move them in for the night, and wait for the sunshine to come out the next day, look at the weather forecast and uh, move them back out into this. Uh, this slide uh, is I, uh, something just to give you some guidance uh, on how to transplant plant to your tomato, tomato seedlings. Tomatoes are one of the most uh, popular pl uh, plants for the, uh, all of our gardening. And uh, there's, it's important to know that uh, you can plant uh, deep, more deeply to get more roots. What I will usually do is when these plants are uh, six to 10 inches tall uh, and have multiple leaves, I will uh, look and I'm gonna go into the uh, garden with this. I will take the pot, I will clip off some of the lower uh, uh, branches that are there so that I can have, and then I'll plant it sideways so that, uh, that I've got the tomato plant uh, at an angle and I have more stem underneath the soil, so I'll get more roots and uh, better productivity. Uh, there's, I think, I just wanted to put this in here and there's an uh, uh, address there for you to go with more information. But you can get your seedlings when they're, put them in the ground when they're six to 10 inches tall and have multiple leaves. So spring planting, let's take a look at the types of uh, vegetables and everything that we can look at for spring. And this is uh, coming out of the uh, greenhouse or coming out of the uh, head start uh, trays. Uh, the head start lettuce, uh, I, I head start the lettuce and the chard and the Asian greens and the cabbage, kohlrabi or broccolis. And I uh, plant these from February to mid April uh, depending upon the frost date. But particularly if it looks like it's going to be cold, I might move them in under a remake cover uh, looking at the, uh, the, the, and I'll show that to you in just a little bit. Uh, having row covers is handy. Uh, one of the things you can hand plant though at this time, your snow peas and radish seeds outside, they will mature by the end of May. What we're trying to do with the three crop approach to this is have this spring planting, which will come out of the garden or most of it uh, by the 1st of June. And then we will have in June, we will have head started again uh, plants that we can go ahead and plant uh, new plants uh, starting in June that will go all the way to uh, September. Uh, and that's why we need to have a uh, understanding of the dates uh, to fruition 
uh, and the uh, the the hat these uh, germination dates, so that we can look at uh, these three different sections and three different types of uh, uh, crops. So uh, we, here is a greenhouse that we have used in one of our beds. Uh, this is just showing the framework. And then we just take Rime uh, going over the top. So that allows us to have a little more uh, protection, uh, particularly for those earlier spring uh, plantings uh, of the whatever we want to put under there, whether it's a, a leaf uh, product or a root product. Um, it's also this type of cover and which is cheap. We just, but that's just uh, that hoop is just water pipe that's cut uh, uh, plastic water pipe that you can bend that you can uh, bend into hoops. Uh, it's also a good insect protection. I've had a lot of trouble with uh, uh, various weevils and uh, and other insects uh, with carrots. Uh, so the vegetable weevil is particularly uh, abundant where I am, and ha having some of this remake covering uh, is important. This is a, the first good picture of Anne Marie's garden. And you can see that I've brought over some of the uh, plants that have been head started, the lettuces and the pak choys uh, for planting. We've already taken out uh, uh, some, well, we've already prepared the beds for that at this point in time. And uh, this could also be, I, you notice up at the top, I said April or fall. Uh, we can do the same plants that fall season uh, these are cool weather seasons, so spring and fall, you can pretty much look at the same uh, plants that uh, for both times. So I might be taking this these flats out. This could be a picture taken in the spring, or it could be a picture taken uh, in the fall. Uh, notice again the, the topsoil here. Uh, this is after many years of work. It's uh, the leaf grow that I use and other compost materials. Uh, we have a very good uh, living uh, soil. So the spring harvest, this is uh, what they look like as we get towards that the end of May. And some of the, you, you might want to manage your garden where you take off the outside leaves so that they keep producing. This is particularly, particularly important for some of the uh, tot choys and pak choys and for that matter Swiss chard and I have a picture of that uh, so that you can get a constant level of production of these greens. Uh, you, then at the end of May, you want to be, we want to be pulling those out of there and you'll uh, just take the whole plant. But here we can take a lot of the leaves on the outside uh, and spread it while they're, uh, use them while they're really fresh and, and uh, harvest them daily. Uh, so now, when we get to the end of May, uh, we will harvest our spring crop crops and improve the soil with more compost. Uh, you have your head started tomatoes that we've seen in the uh, the greenhouses and in the uh, lighting in the house, in the inside. Uh, I always try to have my support cages and stakes in place. Remember, going up uh, in elevation is important uh, to increase your production. So we always have uh, support cages and stakes, particularly for tomatoes, uh, cucumbers. Uh, anything that's going up. Uh, that leaves us more space down below to put in additional uh, plants. It's, uh, I frequently will, uh, if I see an open, I, I can't stand seeing sunlight make it to the soil without going through a plant. So if I see a place opening up in the garden, uh, I'll take a look at uh, the, the season and decide what I could uh, fit in there depending upon what crop is there. If it's gonna be a tall plant and a tomato, uh, I have to think a little bit differently than if it's a short, uh, smaller uh, le uh, uh, height. Uh, let's see. Just as an, uh, it's important then when you are putting these vegetables in the garden uh, that you uh, wait till the afternoon, don't do it in the mornings, uh, wait until the afternoon and then you water them in well. Uh, one of the most important things that you can do as you're planting these young plants is to be sure that you give them a good drink to compact the soil around the, the roots and get them going, especially if this is at any uh, a hot uh, time of the year. So here's a, a picture of our beds again with some of the, you can see the uh, wiring in there and some of the stakes. Uh, that happens to be snow peas. 
Uh, snow peas are interesting in that you can plant those uh, in uh, the cool months, uh, even uh, early February, uh, and let the, they just take their time and they'll come up on their own. But it's good to and the, but they need a a lot of support. They usually get up to about four or five feet or even more in height. So you want to be sure you have something they can go uh, up. Uh, here's a, a tomato plant. I'm going I'm to go back and forth between a couple of pictures here. Uh, this is uh, in full uh, bloom. Uh, you notice that there's no uh, brown leaves of any sort. Uh, they, I, if you look to the left of the tomatoes, there's uh, some f new flowers coming on. And uh, what's interesting is the next picture. That is the same place before we did the pruning. And, uh, and you can see we, we, <laughs> we went away for a couple of weeks and the tomato went nuts and the uh, diseases and uh, things uh, really just overtook the tomato plant. So we came back and we stripped everything down. Uh, suckers are not bad. We often were told, get rid of all your suckers. Well, your suckers are where more flowers will come. Uh, and so it's important to use those flowers and you can channel the energy of your plant uh, by getting rid of all the diseased leaves and coming back to something that looks a little bit like that. And you can bring a tomato all the way through uh, to October by being di diligent about getting rid of the diseased areas and opening up the plant for uh, ventilation and uh, uh, the health of the plant. So now here, we, the, the, I've gone through the summer and here we are back in the fall and you can have your, uh, go ahead and start some of your plants in, inside again uh, to give a, a, a less uh, time for production uh, once it gets into the garden. So uh, I try to plant the first uh, week of September. There's, uh, I just talked to you about pruning tomatoes. That'll bring, if you want it, if you love tomatoes and you want to be sure you have some in the fall, uh, that's one way to get there. Uh, the bush beans uh, can produce well and you can do those. Uh, you can start them indoors, most people don't, but you can get a little, you can get them uh, ready uh, indoors for hand planting, or you can just do the seeds. Uh, a lot of plant, a lot of your uh, uh, bush beans have a uh, 45 or 50 day uh, uh, fruition time. Uh, I, I do head start indoors. I get for particularly for the greens, the pop choys, the kales, the mustards, uh, and move those out in, in late August for uh, and early September. Uh, and you, at this point too, in the fall, you can get your, go all the way with your, plant your root crops, uh, even in seeds, because all of these uh, plants that I have listed at the bottom uh, will make it through to uh, November uh, without too much problem. So that, so this gives us our three crops. We have done the spring, we've done the, the summer and, and, and the types of plants and the things that you can do there. And then here, and this is the third season coming up, and this you can carry all the way uh, to actually with some of the plants and the root plants to December or so. And I have some pictures of that. So here is the uh, pak choy. This is the, one of the plants I like uh, a, a lot. There's pak choy and then there's top choy. Uh, these are all Chinese uh, uh, variables or uh, Japan. And again, uh, they're short season and extremely fast. Uh, which is what is necessary to feed a lot of people in Asia, and it all works for us too. Uh, these uh, these plants, a lot of people don't know what to do with them. Uh, you can, in terms of the leaves and, and the stems, it's particularly good. I use like a raw min, and I'll chop these veggies into there. It gives it a little crunch, and it gives you some good vitamins. Um, I'll saute them with a little olive oil uh, and garlic uh, and uh, I usually will, I'll take the outside leaves first, but then I can take, if I want to have a nice table, these look very nice on the table, I'll take the whole plant because I've got a, a, enough of them in this. Swiss chard is a very interesting plant. Uh, Barbara Kingsolver, the author uh, of vegetable, mineral, and uh, I forget, animal, animal vegetable, all that. Uh, she says that if she had to choose one plant to feed the world, it would be Swiss chard. 
because you can start this in the spring. It will, as long as you keep taking the outside leaves off, uh, it'll go through the uh, summer and it will go through to the next fall. Uh, so here's a year round green supply with uh, all the vitamins and, and uh, uh, good things that come along with this. Uh, here's the fall harvest that uh, it's harvest time right now in, in this particular picture. Uh, some of the, uh, you can see some of the wires in the back. I, we've already taken out the things that were supporting tomatoes and other stuff. We're starting to clean up as we go. Uh, radishes are particularly fast uh, in this and they're, they've got so many different types and colors now that they really brighten up your, your plate. And here we are in December of this year, 29, uh, with the a harvest of tomato, uh, of potato, excuse me, carrots, getting uh, too fast here with my talking. Uh, the, uh, so this was, and I tell you, these carrots were so sweet, uh, and because I think the cold brings that, that sugar. Uh, and the important thing, you see these carrots, I'm gonna go back to this one. So these carrots were at Amory Garden where I have 12 to 14 hours of sun a day. That energy uh, from that sun working uh, uh, throughout the year and all gives you a, at least almost a direct ratio of how much sun you get relative to how much production you get. My gardens uh, at home, you saw that was, was all the shade. Uh, I get about 40 to 60% of the volume in the same space uh, compared to these Amory uh, 12, 14 hour days. Everything is about sunlight. That's what drives photosynthesis. That's what drives the creation of carbohydrates and sugars uh, on the, all the plants of the, of the earth. So that's with about uh, essentially uh, 12, uh, six hours a day of sunshine compared to the other picture. Uh, Midwinter, uh, even well, over the winter time, this is an herb garden, uh, a tower that we have, and there's some sage that is still going. Uh, some, there, some of the oregano stays green. Uh, so you can, uh, this one needs to be cleaned up, but you can go uh, to midwinter. Whoops, I'm going here this way. And look at this cilantro in January. Cilantro is not a summer herb. Uh, and I don't even think about it for the spring. It loves to this uh, fall and will overtake things. Uh, I'm still eating the uh, cilantro right now uh, for some of my raw men with a nice uh, little addition of uh, flavor by the cilantro. So productivity, just to uh, give you an idea of what's possible. And again, it's important to have uh, several of these boxes so that we can rotate uh, and, and uh, it's nice to have these sections. Here you can see that I have some partitions in there and I actually go down to that level on the, on the front part of the picture. You can see some boards going across. I have, and I have numbered on my little charts what each one of those boxes had in it. Uh, so, but every one of these total boxes, which are four foot by 10, averaged about a hundred pounds of produce uh, per year. Uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, when I started this uh, with, at the beginning, uh, without the uh, uh, three crop pro uh, philosophy, I would get about 80 pounds per year from these. So I would look at this as by being a little more attentive, I increased my production to 20 to 25% uh, over what I had before. Um, uh, this is uh, the, the real key elements here then are the, your, the fertility of your soil and you build that with your compost I have not been using any uh, commercial fertilizers in these beds. I just have done it with leaves. I think back to uh, living in Rockville, Maryland, and I, uh, we moved into a house there where across the street, all the neighbors had been dumping their leaves for years. Uh, the leaves were probably four foot deep and uh, 100 foot by 100 foot. And I, my, I had a new property. I took all the leaf, uh, litter and, and compost from that lot and instantly had a garden. So I have uh, a tremendous uh, appreciation for what leaf uh, decomposition and uh, composting does. Uh, so the, the main thing then the, the, that you're managing 
is adequate sunshine, adequate moisture. I haven't talked too much about moisture, and but uh, one of the most important things to do in a garden, I think, is to go out and stand in the garden and look about you and enjoy it, but also look at the leaves. Are they starting to droop? Well, you better put some water in it. You've got to pay attention. And at, at the same time, it's a little bit of uh, like uh, resting your mind and connecting to nature and understanding what insects are there. Uh, if this takes, and by, as you get into this, it's, it's communing with nature and your place in nature. And that's what I enjoy about gardening. And that's a good way to stop uh, this uh, talk. Do you have any questions? Thank you so much, Jim. This was really great. So um, I'm looking at the questions in the chat room. Um, so one question that I have is, um, what are you starting now, if anything? Um, transplant versus um, inside the beds? Well, one of the things about this time of year, this is when you get all your plant, uh, your uh, magazine, your, your, your <laughs> catalogs, your seed catalogs. So I've already bought everything. I've made my plan. So yeah, I got my sketch going. I've made the plan where I'm going to put things, and I have ordered the different things. I'm going to. I always try to try something new and then compare it to the plants that I have before. So I'm uh, right now. I'm getting. Uh, I've bought the uh, the seed uh, planting materials, and I will be starting to plant them in. Uh, uh, the end of March, in the next couple of weeks, all the, all the way through, uh, uh, excuse me, the middle of February, at the end of February and all, on into uh, March, the first couple of weeks of March for getting the stuff in and putting them under the lights and on the heat. Okay, and then someone asked, um, when should you start your sunflowers and pumpkins? Most sun, well, you, the sunflower is like it hot. So what you want to do is plant them, I would tell you, in May. Plant them in May. Most of these are going to be in seeds. Plant them in May and get them out there in the first of June. They, they like that heat. And what was the other, the other group? Pumpkin. The sunflowers and what? Pumpkins. Pumpkin? Mm -hmm. uh, generally, you, you do the pumpkins somewhere in August. Start them out. Or, or late July. Uh, take a look, You're just, you'll get the seed uh, containers or envelopes. Take a look at your time to harvest and, uh, and your time for uh, uh, germination and work from there. But though generally you're looking at midsummer uh, to late summer for that. Okay, so um, someone asked um, what, um, should you grow in a children's garden to increase um, success? I'm not quite sure what um, that question means, but maybe the interest of the garden um, for children. So what other plants would you suggest? Well, it's always nice to uh, plant something that they're going to enjoy eating. Uh, one of the big treats, I think, is a snow pea. And that you can plant, that you plant really early. Uh, looking at your dates and everything that you're, you're looking at that in early February or mid-February. Uh, and it takes a while till May before you get them, but they're so sweet. And to watch the growth and the flowering is uh, very good. Uh, certainly, uh, I would get a, a, a like a cherry tomato uh, with uh, that you can look at for particularly for sweets uh, to try to introduce a child to uh, a, a tomato. When we have the young people come uh, to our garden in uh, June and July uh, in the in the camp, most of them, uh, many of them, have not had a fresh tomato. And if you get that nice, sweet, uh, new uh, uh, cherry tomato and and get them to try that, uh, it, I, you just watch the expression on their face when they taste a really fresh uh, tomato. So. Uh, in terms of beans are easy and they're fast. Uh, the, the bush beans, I would think of that uh, as, as an important thing to have in a children's garden. Uh, if you want to have something that smells good, I have planting some herbs in there that you can put on your food. Uh, basil is very easy, uh, particularly in that. And uh, 
rosemary and other things uh, where they might f be exposed to the different flavors of plants that are possible. Okay, and then someone also commented that maybe even a um, popcorn variety or potatoes. Sure, oh, potatoes, yeah, I'm glad you said that. Uh, we uh, do potatoes every year uh, in those bags, uh, the, the potato bags. And uh, so we have uh, a harvesting, we, we'll, we'll probably have 10 or 12 of the potato bags. And every group that comes through, uh, we put out a, a tarp down uh, after, the, after the potatoes have come to ripeness and we dump it upside down and have the kids go through it and, uh, and, and we'll uh, let them take them home too so that they can taste a real fresh tomato. That's a good one. Okay, so what um, vegetables or flowers would you suggest in a two gallon pot or <laughs> a going bag? Uh, two gallon for most veggies is a, not quite large. I'd get, I'd go, I, I would go to those uh, uh, box, the uh, bags, those larger bags, five gallon. And what I would do there, you can plant anything in that five gallon, or you can plant a tomato. Uh, cucumbers are sort of fun. And they, most, most kids like a cucumber. Uh, but if you do a cucumber, then you gotta have a, 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 some sort of a, a, a cage that it can climb up or a, a, some supporting material. But uh, I, I think that would be the way to go. Okay, um, what do you do um, we in, in regards to um, preventing pests to get rid of them? And, um, out of well, that. if you want to be organic, what we, what I do is I go out there myself and uh, I will pinch them and uh, take, remove them by hand, uh, which is the be best way if you're going to be organic. Yes, and the, uh, the putting the, uh, I, I mentioned that reme cover. Uh, that's a good protection against insects. And so if you design your garden for the size of the reme you have, uh, that's the best way to protect against many of those, particularly if you do a carrot or something like that. And as I mentioned in, earlier, uh, these the carrots coming out of these gardens, when you take a fresh carrot out compared to in the store, it, it, go to the store and buy a carrot at, at the same time that you harvest your, your uh, carrot and put them side by side so they can see the difference. Okay, so do you have any suggestions on growing vegetables in either shade or partial shade? Tough. Uh, the lettuces are a little more tolerant. Uh, tomatoes won't like it. Eggplants won't like it. Cucumbers won't like it. And you, now one of the things you can do is, for instance, is to use your tomato plants that are high and give you some shade. That helps if you uh, are putting in the lettuce uh, close to it, you have to calculate uh, your locations. Where will the sun be uh, in terms of giving you the, the lettuce some shade so that they don't like it too hot, but you can provide the type of shade that they would like. Okay, and do you use any fertilizer or is compost um, just good enough? I generally don't use fertilizer. The compost has worked for me as it is. The, uh, some of the uh, uh, liquid fertilizers, uh, what, what's the name of that? Uh, miracle Grow. I've used on occasion to perk something up. Uh, but I try to keep the, what happens when you use the artificial fertilizers is the salts start to build up in the soil, which reduces the uh, living community in there. Uh, and so I try to keep everything. Nature has been... Uh, going at this for uh, millennia in terms of leaves creating the soils that are productive. So I try to use the uh, compost, uh, composted leaves uh, and I really like the leaf, uh, leaf grow uh, materials. So when you were talking about um, growing the snow peas in um, February, did that mean direct sowing them in the Direct ground? sowing. You can start them ahead too, but uh, you can go direct sowing uh, in the, uh, they're designed for that. If you grow um, potatoes in the grow bags, what type of soil do you use? 
Same thing. Uh, I take the, uh, I, I will go there and put in some compost uh, uh, pot soil from time to time uh, in those because it's easy if I don't have the, the uh, other soil. But generally you want a nice, rich, loose soil uh, for anything you grow. Can you so grow? If, for instance, you could put, you could put, and there's a instruction, there's uh, recipes for that, uh, those bags for, and it, it requires a little bit of peat moss, uh, a little bit of, uh, and I think Cheryl next week, the, the, the uh, talk that we have next week, uh, is uh, done by Cheryl Munn, and he does his whole garden in uh, in these bags, including potatoes. So that would be a good way. But he just uses a rich soil uh, that you, uh, even a good rich potting soil will work to some degree. Or you can make it all yourself out of the uh, leaf, the uh, regular soil and some peat moss and maybe some perlite uh, so that it's nice and loose and light. Can you um, grow sweet potatoes in these grow bags? Absolutely. Just like any other potato. Ah, is I'm that reading it? the chat, so I'm making sure I'm getting all of the questions. Um, so one question is, do you need to lift that daily for sunlight to get in or for pollinators? Oh, the Rime, uh, the sun will come right through. It's, it's, it lets the sunlight in. Pollinators, uh, no. So you can pretend like you're a bee if you want. Uh, I do for certain things. Uh, I will take a, uh, a brush and uh, go to the pollen and then I will bring that to the various plants. That, you know, particularly I do that uh, on some trees like the pawpaw tree, I will play the bee and I'll get the pollen and I'll move over there and I'll hand pollinate. Uh, you can do the same sort of thing. Uh, or what you do is open the, uh, the rime, uh, if, if you have a plant that needs that, uh, for a short period of time, the insects will get in there real quick uh, in terms of pollination and then you cover it back up again. But that, you take a little bit of a risk there about a weevil sneaking in. When rotating the crops, do you move them to a different section or the same bed? It depends upon what it is. Generally, I try to rotate. I would say uh, having uh, four of these sections, four beds, uh, 10 by four, uh, it would be perfect. Or you can make it six by six or whatever it is. But at least you know what was in there before. And I will always try, particularly with the, the group of uh, the uh, the tomatoes and peppers and all, I try to rotate them out every year. So just, just be sure you have enough containers that you can do that rotation. Any thoughts on keeping the squirrels from eating the crops? <laughs> uh, none that are legal. <laughs> uh, I have fought sh squirrels uh, for e in every garden I have ever had. I find a squirrel trap is nice, but you have to find out what the regulations are. But I have, uh, at one time I had a, enough squirrels that I took uh, a 25 in a season to a new place that would they would be very happy in, but it was away from my garden. Um, another question is when um, do you add your compost? Is it in the fall after harvesting? Um, when do you add your compost to your bed? I, I, I do it in various times. Uh, certainly in the springtime, I, I'll add it and turn it in for a little refresher. Uh, I will, uh, when I've harvested something, because what we're doing, when we're harvesting, we're taking the nutrients out of the soil because the, what was in that soil is now in the plant. So I'll put, when I harvest anything, I will put more of the compost in. Uh, so every time, and we're here with three seasons, uh, so you, you have three applications of your compost. Okay, and um, where can you get leaf grow in Calvert County? And one person did mention Hatchers in Honeytown. Yes, Hatchers is one. Uh, Calvin Wood uh, up in Leonard, uh, St. Leonard. Is there, that's where I get my leaf grow. 
I do it by the load. I, t I have a small trailer uh, where I can put a, a cubic yard in and he will uh, just dump it right in your trailer. Uh, other than that, he will deliver uh, and he, by the yard. Uh, and I'm sure hatchers will do the same sort of thing and you can have a place they, they can dump it. And then that you could use throughout your other yard to, to make things better. Uh, even if you need a place to put it, put it on the grass and, and shrubs. Uh, and it's a lot cheaper than by buying by the bag. That was Calvin Wood that I use and, the, and there's hatchers. Do you start potatoes and sweet potatoes at the same time? Um, they yes. March 17th is what they heard? Yes, that's about right. In fact, uh, you can't get the starts uh, from the uh, various suppliers, uh, Burpees or whatever, uh, 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 all the farm stores. You can't get those starts until just about March. And you were talking about um, threshing the soil. You just mean um, adding the leaf grow or- Right on the top. Right, right on the top and uh, uh, curl it under a little bit. You don't want to go too deep. You want to keep the structure of the soil uh, as much as possible. So you want to sort of do that on the top. Anything that you put on the top will work its way down through the whole soil. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not just emptying the um, raised bed. No, no, you don't do it. No, no. In fact, I've never taken anything out of the raised bed. It just gets, it gets used by all the insects, the worms, the, the pill bugs, the, all the different things that eat that uh, organic material. A, a, this, the, a good soil that over time is, is loose and full of life. And you can look at it and you'll see all sorts of little insects uh, uh, in a compost pile and in your garden. And these are, many of them are very important for breaking down stuff. Okay, that was the last question, I believe, um, from the chat. Um, we can keep on answering people's questions. I want to thank everybody for attending this Garner Smarter. And like Jim said, the next um, Garner Smarter is Bags, Bears, and Old Boots on Saturday, February 20th at 10 a.m. And you can start registering for it at the Calvert Library website. So um, feel free to stay on. I'm gonna stop the recording and um, thank you for attending.